Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the second series of Call My Supervisor, the PhD podcast for the School of Politics and Economics at King's College London. We are delighted to say that after a hugely enjoyable first series last year, the school has let us do it all over again. Once again this year, we'll be speaking to doctoral candidates from one of our departments to pick their brains about all things PhD, from their research and ideas to their revelations and advice. For those of you who are new, my name is Daniel Mansfield. I am the Communications Officer for the School of Politics and Economics, and I'm pleased to introduce you to my co-host for this episode, Cameron Mitchell-Bell, an undergraduate studying with the Department of Political Economy. Hi, Cameron. Hello, Daniel. Good morning. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you our guest for this episode, Constantine Peebling, a doctoral candidate studying with the Department of Political Economy. Welcome, Constantine. Good morning, you too. So uh, it's great to have you with us, Constantin. So my first question is, can you please introduce the title of your research and exactly what you're, um, what you're up to? Yeah, thank you for having me. So my working title is Effects of Germany's Move to the Knowledge Economy on Firm Strategies to Secure Skills. So um, this is still a working title. I haven't found this one catchy, nice title to put on my dissertation once I submit it. Um, so it's more descriptive right now, but I think it's uh, pretty much what I'm doing. So I'm trying to find out how, um, as a consequence of digitalization, the transition to the knowledge economy, firms have changed their strategies towards hiring and securing people with the skills they require within the knowledge economy. Okay, so... Can you expand a little more on what that's about? What are you going to be looking at? So generally, I look at how firms have changed their strategies, which means that uh, I understand that or I, I, my hypothesis is that firms developed strategies or began increasing their use of strategies to attract and retain people because uh, they now have very different skill demands. So what we've seen in, let's say, the 20th century was that they needed very specific skills, medium high, particular, typically industrial type skills. So what you need, vocational education and training, higher education at the margin only. And uh, with the transition to the knowledge economy, this, this has changed a lot. Um, so now firms really require more of these very high general skills, usually associated with university education, to, to have people to pick up on very fast changing environments, fast changing products and services. So it's less about what you've learned during your education, but more about to transfer your skills to a new environment. And we have seen a second effect, and which, which is a bit disputed among um, political economists, is what has happened to the low end scale of, uh, of skills. And here, um, my I'm, I'm a huge follower of kind of this U-shaped curve, where, where we have seen a huge increase in the demand of low-end service sector skills or low-end skills as well, like in the hospitality sector or haircuts, et cetera. These things can't be automated yet, so we still have a demand for that. But these mid-level skills, there we see a huge drop. And what firms have is they have a stock of people with this mid-level, high, very specific skills, which are totally fine for kind of for the old economy type business models needed. But now they, they have to shift that towards uh, the new economy type product services and um, in connection with that need different skills. And um, I, I regard that there's a scarcity on this labor market. So I, I phrase it as uh, labor or skill biased labor shortages. And um, I, try, I try to observe and understand how firms go about and uh, in attracting and retaining people with these strategies. And uh, I look at Germany, which is important to say because countries differ in their economic structure. And in Germany, we've seen a huge shift in that from this very coal and steel business um, that we've seen largely in the 20th century towards how the 21st 
century rolled out. And um, firms struggle a lot because we not only have this shift in skill demands, we also see very, very strong demographic effects, which make it a lot harder to, to go about in this market. So we have a, kind of a double scarcity there. And that's really a strong effect that we see there. And observing that and understanding that is kind of uh, the, the academic motivation behind that on the empirical side. And there's also some theoretical stuff, but empirically speaking, that's kind of what I'm looking at. Okay, that is really interesting. So uh, what was it exactly that drew you to this in terms of your general interests or your previous academic history? So uh, I, I would love to say that this was kind of love at first sight, but it was half pragmatic, half theory driven. So uh, I was supervised by my current supervisor, uh, David Hope, during my MA thesis uh, when I was studying political economy at, at King's. And um, I researched a similar thing in my MA thesis, and it stuck with me. And I had the idea, OK, there's a theoretical gap because um, there's lots of literature covering how firms try to change the institutions in the sphere of education, training, and labor markets in Germany. But they first regarded firms as a more of a uniform block. So without looking at firm size, sector of operation, these firm ca characteristics, I regarded them as very important. And I was a bit um, surprised that they weren't properly tackled in that. And secondly, I wanted to see how firms reacted. So I found it a bit weird, so to say, that um, other authors kind of ignored what firms do. So they, they didn't give firms agency only to the extent that they were able to change institutions, but didn't regard them as a proper player within this whole mess of change that we've seen in labor markets and skill formation since the beginning of the millennium. So what struck me was, um, okay, there's a thing. I found it interesting and I found a good gap. So it was kind of, yeah, I, it, it, would be, it would be overestimated to say, okay, it was just, just one thing that I was 100% purely interested. It was kind of a portion was strategic and a, and a large part was interest. And um, yeah, that brought me to, to the idea of pitching that to Dave and he was uh, very happy and willing to supervise me. And that's kind of how I stumbled into the PhD. That's fantastic. So what do you think are some of the implications of this research with regards to how the public should react in terms of applying for jobs and how firms would react or anything in general? My, my methods are, I use mixed methods. So I use a very large data panel and I also do interviews and interviews with uh, both unions, employer associations and individual firms. And speaking to those individual firms, it was a bit shocking, to be honest, because um, I learned that everybody is struggling so much, but they haven't really implemented proper strategies. So, for example, I was talking to a um, typical German firm in the mid, mid rural area doing uh, production and uh, a kind of manufacturing sector, small, small medium sized enterprise. They had 250 employees, 150 years old, and they really have, I would say, ancient approaches to labor markets. So, for example, they don't use even LinkedIn. They, they publish their job announcements in the local newspaper, not for strategic reasons, but just because the senior boss said, yeah, we, we have always done it like that. And having this, um, this problem on the one side and on the other side, how they went about trying to solve that it it's, it's really seemed to be very simplistic to me. And I, my, my personal uh, message for me, the message for me was that firms um, need to do much more and really run into a problem if firms don't step up the game. If you want to hold on to a very good economic basis that is uh, decentralized uh, and running for quite a long time. So I think there's lots, lots of demand on firms on firm side to to change their game Constantine, a couple of questions on this um as you said the german economy has been very good in the 20th century at, at training these uh, these people for the industrial sector right so it had a very good vocational skills system 
why or do you think it has been slow to see this transition coming or has it happened too quick for the state to see it coming what have you found that's a really tough question because i think it's very multi-dimensional i think there's for sure a cultural aspect to it that change is not seen very positively because it always worked quite well then we still have a very strong industrial base i think germany is still very good at producing stuff and innovating stuff and having this marginal innovative model doing very sl small continuously changes to a product or service and they're really good at it looking forward i'm not really sure if this will sustain because what we see is um the digitalization is uh, lacking in germany still many many households and firms do not have a proper are not properly digitalized and that starts by having fiberglass uh, fiber to the home or fiber to the plant um, these kind of things are just the basics of digitalizing themselves beyond that i think there's one thing that's usually usually underestimated that's demographic effects we have this huge group of uh, baby boomers who now slowly retire and we see a very small cohort of people coming later and we have a gap in the labor market and i think it's uh, around 100 to 2000 people net leaving the labor markets per annum and we just have a, yeah, a shortage of people who do the job and that's really threatening for the german economy years to come and at the same time it's very good projectable because we really see the problem coming and um, we struggle at solving it in addition to the other cultural and uh, yeah hard facts like fiberglass i think that's the most important problem or threat to the german economy and you you touched on the methods you use there interviews and uh, and other sorts of research how have you found that is it been easy to talk to people are they willing to talk is the information easily accessible so uh, I was lucky to use a data set from the FDZ. It's kind of the, the research data center belonging to the Federal Agency for Employment. And uh, they have a very nice data panel on, uh, it's called EIB Establishment Panel. And they, tr they have a data panel going back, I think, to the 1992 um, and have a very good data quality. And they asked firm level specific data, uh, firm level specific variables of a, of a very very high quality and uh, that was really nice to use on the other side it's uh, very uh, weakly anonymous data so the process of extracting the final results is a bit painful and tricky because they censor a lot if you infringe on it but i think it's it's very comparatively easy instead of uh, own data collection which has its flaws as well and then having the interviews really helped a lot. It was quite tough to get people on record because usually academic interviews, uh, you take out 45, 60 minutes of, out of someone's day in which they can't produce anything for the company or get their normal work done. So um, you're really in an inferior position there. So people don't uh, knock on your door and ask you, hey, can I be interviewed by you? But it's it's absolutely the opposite you have to ask people and it uh, turned out to be a bit uh, troublesome here and there so what's really helped was a snowballing so asking people i interviewed about contacts hey do you know someone who could be willing to talk to me or having uh, a good good idea that um, you think would be valuable for me and that helped a lot or for example um, I, w I went to an event here in berlin where a person was speaking who was kind of ignoring me before and I just went straight after the event to them and asked them hey would you be willing to talk to me and and going there in person was quite more more effective but despite this kind of painful process of getting those on on record it really helped a lot because uh, it helped me identifying the variables that are really important and also interpreting certain results for example if we see people working beyond their retirement age as a data point it doesn't tell a lot because there are very different stories behind that data point, potentially. For example, people could work longer because they're bored. They, we, we live longer, so we have more of our pension in, in sense of time, and people are fitter when they retire. And some people 
just want to work longer or work half time to have this kind of a slow process into retirement. Then we have people who have to work longer because out of need because their salary wasn't high enough or their pension isn't high enough. And then potentially, and it sits, I think, uh, between those is when firms really require people to continue longer because they don't have another person taking over the job or they have to do some trying on the job before the person retires. So there's a good skill transfer. And having these three def very different stories helps understanding this data point and having asked people, okay, why are people retiring later? Help really giving some nuance to that data point. So here really comes um, into, into power the, the, the effect of having uh, mixed methods because purely data points are sometimes a bit difficult to interpret it and, and have the room for, uh, for a bias because maybe I think people work longer because they, they, their pension is not high enough. And then I give it give the research some biases and having these interviews and the data really helps canceling out biases from both sides. So that was really, really good while it was a lot of work. With respect to your dissertation, would you say that there's anything regarding the German cultural, economic, political context that has particular implications on your dissertation? So, for example... I know in Germany they have laws regarding co-ownership, uh, where firms over a certain size need to allow workers on the board of directors. Is there anything like that that has particular in, um, interest with respect to Germany and this in light of this new information? So generally, I, I tackled both unions uh, and employer associations also on their positions and kind of having them as an umbrella to what's telling me what's going on. And what we've seen in Germany is this called Sozialpartnerschaft, kind of this social partnership between unions and employers declining. So we have a, a smaller and increasingly lower coverage of trade agreements. And that's something uh, others have monitored. I, I only use those information. And um, that binds in quite well with what I'm doing because uh, what they found out as a motivation to leave these trade agreements is that uh, firms wanted to be freer at uh, wage setting and to pay certain groups higher wages and not be kind of bound by, by the trade agreements. So if you have um, people who have engineering um, degrees, you want to pay them a surplus because everybody is competing for them. So um, here what we see is kind of an institutional shift changing that. And I can imagine, I, I haven't spoken to one, but I can imagine that there is, um, can be a, some friction between these boards where you have someone sitting from the works council side on the board or who's belonging to the unions that uh, they may see that very critical because they have an interest in keeping up the unions, having them as a, as a larger size. And being having having them as a, as a strong force in in these new, new uh, negotiations. So um, what I could see is that um, there's some struggle. And I, in addition to um, these declining trade agreements, it's not that they are kind of thrown out of the window because employers really look at what is written in there. These are kind of the benchmark at wage setting. So when employers look, okay, what's our wage bans at our company, they look usually look at at what are the trade agreements for for the for a certain sector. And if it's, for example, fifty thousand euros, they will be somewhere in that area. Or if you have, look at a reduction in working hours per week, they usually look at what is going on there, but they want to have this kind of freedom to to step outside this framework. And uh, how far through your research are you? Is there any particular milestones that you've got left? Uh, can you tell me about that, please? Luckily, I'm approaching the end of my PhD. Uh, I'm kind of three and a half years in. I'm now in the writing up stage. So I've finished my empirical analysis. I just need to uh, get some graphs uh, polished to, to put in the dissertation. I'm currently writing my um, quantitative analysis chapter. And uh, the next step would be to, to get everything together, have a good look at it with my supervisors, and then uh, identify, okay, what's, what are the fields where I have to change something? Because something that's often happened is you begin writing early in your PhD, and then you tilt a bit your research question. And sometimes you have to adapt the literature analysis or so. 
a, a bit to what you're finally doing. And that's something I still need to do. And then I hope to, to be able to submit late summer, early autumn. Constantine, do you think this work you've been doing is unique to Germany? Or would you say some of your findings have um, applications in other European economies? Usually I'm a bit hesitant to say, okay, we can apply them to everywhere. But I think given some constraints within every economy, having more, more kind of more liberal market economy types than in the UK, some of these things don't apply 100%. But uh, since firms are generally struggling, demographic effects aren't a German unique thing. And firms need more generalized high skills. There, I, I do see, or I would see that there's some competition and similar struggles in other countries too. Um, the UK is quite interesting in that because traditionally, as a more liberal market economy, there was a stronger focus on generalized skills than there was in Germany or in France or in Switzerland. So um, my my hypothesis would be that the UK still would have some struggles and some adaptions, but it wouldn't be kind of this far reaching deep change that we've seen in Germany. But I haven't researched it, so uh, I, I don't I don't want many I do not want to make any claims here, but I think this is something that would apply there too. And and post PhD, uh, would you be looking to um, submit this for a journal article or, or perhaps put some uh, policy paper together? Have you got any ambitions for it? I haven't hundred percent decided on this. So the the rule is that you have to hand in as a book project, and which made a lot of sense in my case because I have this very huge empirical block that took some time to 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 put together. But um, it's often this strategy, kind of kind of this salami strategy, that you slice a bit off of it and then publish it as a, as a paper. So I have to talk about it with my supervisors, but there would be the possibility to kind of cut my dissertation afterwards in half or in three parts and publish them separately to kind of just just to reach a broader audience because I think people tend to read more journal articles and they tend to read more books. And in addition, um, I thought about it just just this week. So it's kind of very new, very new idea to publish it in German as a very short book, maybe 50 to 100 pages as kind of popular science thing to, to reach an audience to have it as a, yeah, as a self-marketing tool. Mainly, uh, I don't plan to have a huge book success, but if it, it would, if it would turn out like it, I wouldn't mind it. But to have a book targeted for managers, people in HR who um, want to read something about it and to show them quantitatively and qualitatively at a very high standard what I was doing, what I found, but in a language that is understandable by a broad audience because science... Uh, is sometimes a bit tricky to to understand, and that's it's a bit of a gatekeeping there by language and uh, models and kind of what we mean when we say certain things. But just to tone it down verbally and reach a broader audience, that would something I would be potentially interested. Has there been anything in particular about this experience that surprised you or stood out to you? I think, in, to a certain degree, it uh, turned out as I, as I imagined it, but. Starting in the midst of the pandemic was quite a challenge. And I was surprised how well it worked out. And I think the most important aspect for that was that I have really good supervisors or supervisors that I have a very good relationship to. And I think without having this good relationship, I think I wouldn't have made it so far and maybe would have stopped doing the PhD because the pandemic, I think, was quite tough in general and sitting at home and doing the research alone can be challenging but having those people on board was really really good and helped me a lot there and in addition i think um i underestimated how much work it would be to get the empirical part done particularly with the statistical analysis where i think where i thought hey it's only me compiling stata code and uh, I'm, I'm not relying on potential interviewees who aren't answering or so it took me much longer because um, we have imperfect data all the time. 
and um, then going around trying to fix things, reading a lot. It was really a lot of self-learning, and I would not have imagined that this would be so intense and taking so much time, to be honest. Excellent. Um, Constantine, thank you so much. That is the end of the first part of the podcast today. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back for part two, we're going to speak a little bit more about your personal experience and maybe delve into some advice that you've got too. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to the mid-segment of the Call My Supervisor podcast. This round is called Thesis Thunder, and we aim to explore the most exciting and groundbreaking doctoral dissertations in politics and economics. I'm here with my amazing co-host, Clara, and we're here with some fantastic uh, works of intelligentsia from our domain. Today, I explore some political theory from Hewlin 2023 and their insightful work on democratization of the workplace. So let's start at the beginning, exploring how work serves as the epicenter of a complex web of interdependence. So the dissertation sheds light on the historical patterns showcasing how work as the primary source of income for many perpetuates inequality. Asset poor workers find themselves enmeshed in a relationship with asset rich company owners, establishing a foundation for understanding the disparities within the social structure that we exist in. So venturing forward, the dissertation introduces us to post-work visions, a compelling challenge to conventional views on labor. Concepts like universal basic income and reduced working hours take center stage. The study adeptly unpacks persuasive arguments against the prevailing productivist ethic, empathizing the potential for societal experimentation and the liberation of individual autonomy from the shackles of traditional employment. Now, let's look at a pivotal section that delves into the realm of democratic economic planning, notably featuring Pat Devine's model. The study explores the idea of replacing private authority over production with negotiated coordination. By doing so, it envision, envisions a more egalitarian distribution of power, countering the current trend of power concentrating among a privileged th few. A democratic economy, the study argues, must not neglect the pursuit of freedom from work. We'll emphasize the persuasive propositions put forth by post-work theorists empathizing with universal basic income and reduced working hours. These proposals are not just about altering work dynamics, they're about enabling ind uh, individual citizens to convene on equitable grounds, liberated from the bonds of dependency. So uh, now we look into real life experiences of on-demand couriers. The dissertation seamlessly blends normative ideas with uh, gritty critiques of the gig economy workers uh, that we see today. Uh, workplace democracy takes center stage, offering a potential remedy to the arbitrary power dynamics faced by gig workers. Uh, the study advocates for a unique form of workplace democracy that extends beyond traditional models, envisioning socially owned platforms under the democratic control of workers. Expanding on the limitations of democratizing uh, work at a firm level, the dissertation ventures into post-work proposals, including universal basic, inc basic income and collective working time reduction. While acknowledging their uh, emancipatory potential, the study critically examines their democratic limitations. It studies the importance of extending democratic powers over production, steering us toward a more comprehensive vision of democratization. I've got a number of questions. Yeah, sure, let's go. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think my, my initial question is what led you to kind of pick a more philosophical kind of paper, because I know last session we were talking about something completely different. We were touching on ideas of climate change and more, I guess, empirical be a contested concept so how come how come we you you chose this work so alternative to alternatives to capitalism is not actually something i've delved too much into in my degree i felt like it's more it's more related to critiquing the foundations of what we have right now as opposed to how we could uh, ameliorate the current conditions that we live in based on the framework that we exist in and that's not something i've delved too much into throughout my degree and I found this concept of cooperatism relatively interesting. So when we think of democratizing the workplace, are we, are we replacing one boss with another? So your boss is no longer the individual who's, you know, obviously in a Marxian perspective, commanding the means of production, basically renting out his property for you to use. And he derives, you know, the profits from your um, labor surplus value. But then if you were to have half, you know, the labor force become your boss instead of them, does that lead to overall better conditions? Is it possible that half the labor force can still exploit the other half? 
And this is something that I've heard explored quite a lot in um, contemporary theory, like mo mostly online, but um, all over the place. There's uh, theorists like Richard Wolff, for example. He's done a lot of interviews recently about worker cooperatives and democratizing the economy. And I find it an interesting concept to consider. Whilst I'm not necessarily on board with it, I feel like it's definitely worth exploring, considering it, it basically makes us ask the question, what is it about what is about democracy that we value? And I find that I find that to be an important question, particularly on where where it most necessitates um, where it most uh, necessitates uh, improving. And so, yeah, I was wondering what you thought about that. I, I think it's fascinating. I think that the idea of democratizing the workplace has a lot of different implications. So you mm -hmm. mentioned one of it being like efficiency and how exactly that would play out. But I think another one, if we want to bring it back to what we were talking about last week about you know kind of economic implications. I wonder whether if within efficiency we incorporate kind of economic and business savvy implications of democratization. So whether or not democratizing the workplace creates new incentives for people to put in more effort and thus being more productive, or whether it's actually the opposite because they have more leverage, they have higher bargaining power, they're able to kind of slack off or maybe free ride in a way that is less economically or, or business um, savvy. Yeah, I completely agree. So I'm trying to imagine, so... With the research that's been done on worker cooperatives and democratizing the workplace, there's been significant sample selection bias, i.e. the current people who are prone to starting a worker cooperative are already of a leftist mentality, and so they're most likely to get along with the environment that's created by a worker cooperative. But then suppose we were to expand that to, for example, any given supermarket chain like Walmart or Asda. Well, what would happen if they, you know, f you know for obvious reasons, vote to increase their wages? And that reduces the amount of capital stock they have, meaning that they are much more cautious when it comes to, you know, um, ascertaining certain types of goods. Because, well, I, you know, I don't know if the demand next week is going to increase significantly or decrease significantly. And I'm not going to have the extra, I guess, collateral that I would have other, otherwise derived from labor surplus value. I'm not going to have the extra collateral to be able to absorb the damages if there is a change in my environment. And so... You know, workers inherently following their own interest in that instance might not necessarily be good for the overall business structure and, I guess, support for the economy that we see widely today. And so I guess I find that to be an intriguing argument. Yeah. But uh, I would also say that this is something that requires more research. You know, there have been, there's also been evidence to suggest that the work cooperatives that exist have higher rates of productivity, for example. Yeah. The one, there's uh, big ones in Portugal and Spain. And they've been a, sh a shining beacon for the world about how worker, workplace democracy could sh be a potential future uh, structure of the workplace. And I find that interesting. And I'm not forcibly against that if it leads to better results or if it just naturally happens. Uh, I believe that there were some policy options under Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto that potentially led to workers being able to buy out the uh, workplace in a failing business, making or uh, leading the way for the opportunities for more worker cooperatives to exist. But I guess this is one of those instances where time will simply tell, you know, yeah. uh, it's an interesting concept to consider, but I, I don't have the foresight to know exactly what the implications would be in the long run if we were to adopt this across the board. And I guess the last point of, of conversation as we kind of wrap up your PhD section and move on to some different ideas is you bring up the idea of generalizability and whether or not this research can be applied in, in different dimensions or, or labor spheres. And I guess that brings, we were talking about econometric and quantitative methods before we began recording. And I guess my question would be in the research that you observed in this PhD, do they run a regression to kind of account for these different fixed effects or different confounding variables or omitted variables that might be able to explain some of these questions that we're having right now? Because absolutely, like looking at it in terms of different different spheres of the labor market, whether that be supermarkets, whether that be regions of the country, that might have completely different implications and different success rates, um, given kind of the measure of success that we're using. Yeah, that, that's absolutely going to have to be necessary. I mean, this is obviously just purely a theoretical, a, a poll theory mm -hmm. um, dissertation. And so I don't, I don't know, you know, if they were to <laughs> expand this to a more of a quantitative uh, methodology, I don't know exactly what the implications of that would be. But I think, I think it's kind of, to a large extent, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like, there's a lot of useful implications for it, but at the end of the day, it's coming at this from a normative perspective that this is really what's beneficial to people. At the end of the day, you know, whether 
my standard of living is constantly improving. Uh, the fact that that is the case is superfluous because I still feel that I am in an inferior position and that my generated value is being extracted from me. And, you know, that is intrinsically or inherently a bad thing. You know, these are normative values that we're speaking of. And I guess at the end of the day, whether or not um, empirically we can determine that good things result from that, it's still derived from uh, normative uh, con uh, conceptions of right and wrong. And I guess that's what's important here. That's what's important to remember. That's why, you know, if worker cooperatives become more successful, then I'm not going to be against that. Um, people feel free to organize business structures exactly how they want. But uh, I, I would... I'd be curious to see if that's actually the case because I don't think necessarily people are going to normatively consider the purpose of work cooperatives or workplace democratization as valid. Great. And so moving from kind of this idea of a theoretical approach to research and the idea of democracy to a more empirical approach and, and looking at technocracy, I'm actually going to be presenting the work of Munyai in at the University of Warwick, um, a paper, a PhD paper that he published in 2022, so quite recent. And it's looking at the ECB and the role of technocratic politics and, and policies um, within the EMU and kind of the shift that we've seen within the European Monetary Union to a more top-down approach and kind of the implications of that. So it begins kind of by observing that the 2008 financial crisis has had quite an impact on the way that the EMU works and how developments and further integration of the EMU have taken place post-2008. And so those are kind of the two leading questions for him as, as he's approaching um, this larger body of research. Uh, and it's looking at both kind of the EMU's fiscal and economic domains and looking at what factors may be influencing. So while the 2008 might have been a catalyst or kind of like a something that has split the EMU into two temporal spheres, uh, he also wants to account for different, different factors. Going back to kind of quantitative methods, being able to account for different unobserved variables or unobserved heterogeneity is kind of a big deal when we're looking at something that has had a catalyst, but also we must acknowledge that it's moving through a temporal sphere and other factors are also at play. Um, so he's looking at kind of, you know, fiscal policy employs, structural reforms, and different economic structures as case studies and, and compares them throughout um, pre-2008 and also post-2008. And I think what, what he kind of con concludes to his research is that the ECB has adopted a more top-down approach and kind of enlisted some more technocratic ideas post-2008. Um, and I guess something that's important and kind of some implications that might, might be interesting to look at is kind of how the European community reacts to this kind of change. Because again, technocracy kind of stands to a certain extent against democracy, and there's been long-lasting debates, historically so, with Edmund Burke, with you know, the idea of the wisdom of the multitude against the wisdom of the experts and, and how that kind of can be resolved mm. when it comes to supranational institutions like the ECB. And so seeing this shift post-2008 is, is quite interesting to see how it'll play out, to see how the EMU will further develop, because as new countries are, are joining the EMU, like we were seeing Romania trying to attempt to access potentially in 2024, likely sometime in the future, not 2024. Um, it's interesting to see how international organizations are going to keep developing, considering maybe different political tensions and, and tensions in the public. Yeah, so someone posed a really interesting question in the seminar. Mm -hmm. So in terms of anti-democratic sentiment, someone asked the question, why do we not have a centralized organization that determines ideal tax levels? Like in the same way that, you know, we have a centralization, a central organization that determines ideal interest rates. Um, and basically, a lot of the sentiment around that was related to the normativity of where of um, tax ideology and empirical uh, tax sentiment among economists and experts. Basically. You may feel that a normative outlook on taxation is more ideal. You know, if the government feels that redistributive policies are a moral imperative, then that may supersede what economists think and what um, experts believe to be the ideal tax rate on the attributes of the economy that they're looking at, despite the fact that um, these things cannot, cannot really be proven in a normative sense. But then... Could you say the same for interest rates? You know, are interest rates coming from more of a normative perspective? Like, uh, if you like, if you print money, that's going to cause inflation. That's going to be uh, distributed all across the economy. But then, uh, increasing interest rates, that's going to, um, or decreasing interest rates, that's going to also rely on a normative, like monetarist, I guess, perspective. So yeah, I was wondering what you thought of that because there's a lot of a lot of debate with regards to exactly who should have power over what in this instance. You know. Yeah, I think that 
The domain, I think that's a fascinating question. And I think that the domain of economics has often been left to kind of the experts, which I think is, is quite interesting because we both do political economy. We kind of analyze the relationship between politics and economics. And it's widely accepted that politics should be ruled by the multitude, should be in the hands of the people. But then why is it that economics is more, more so accepted to be ruled by the experts? Because I would contend that politics are equally as complicated and complex mm. than economics. And I guess you can make certain distinctions within the domain of politics because, for example, international relations are not left to the people. And maybe that's an area that's more complex, has greater implications for the good of the people and is more nuanced in a way that the common man or woman or individual might not be able to kind of rationalize with. Mm. Yeah, no, in terms of the, the specific questions about tax versus interest rates, I think that's actually a really interesting point because I think interest rates affect people much in the same way than taxes do. Because, mm -hmm. for example, raising interest rates to tame, in, to tame inflation and cool down the economy has contractionary pressures that negatively impacts kind of, if, if you look at it empirically, negatively impacts low-income families to begin with. And same with the opposite, when we're seeing a recession and we're increasing interest rates, who is benefiting from that? Well, people who can take out loans in the first place, which are wealthier people. Mm. So I think it's, I think it's interesting because both impact the working class or, or different areas or, or social groups. Yeah. In in quite direct ways, but yet in taxation, people have more of a say than they do in interest rates. And I think this idea of an optimal level of interest rates compl completely neglects kind of social and, and political considerations. I think it's, I don't have an answer, but I think it's it's something to to be noted. If mm. we do agree that taxation should be in the hands of the people, then why don't we think that kind of monetary policy should be as well? I mean, we saw this come to a head when Liz Truss introduced mm. the mini budget. You know, they say that uh, she was basically fired by the Bank of England yeah. because obviously people's mortgages went through the roof as a exactly, result of that. Yeah. And, you know, if the Bank of England was not independent from the uh, government, that wouldn't have been the case. The mini budget would have gone through. She'd maybe still be prime minister. Yeah. And obviously they didn't go along with that. But, you know, people might have people might have something to say about that. You know, why why did this independent group whose leader is, you know, an expert, their degrees in history, not yeah. economics. Yeah. Why did they ha get to have a say over this thing that affects everyone's life and that the people, I mean, people didn't vote for Liz Truss. The Conservative Party did, obviously. Yeah. But people voted for the Conservative Party and the, the Conservative Party voted for Liz Truss. So, you know, that's a, I think that's a multifaceted question and that would be very interesting to see further research on and further questioning on. Uh, what, so what did you think of this thesis overall? I think it's really interesting. I think my, my undergraduate dissertation is on the European Monetary Union. And exactly on kind of EU ex or Euro accession strategies, in particular in Romania. And I think seeing this shift to more of a technocratic approach to kind of setting interest rates, setting austerity packages, setting fiscal policy is really interesting going forward because I think one of the main issues of the ECB and something that's been critiqued for at least since 2008 has been kind of the non homogeneity of Eurozone states and kind of how that can play out given that optimal currency theory supports that it will only be optimal in the case that all states are homogeneous and they face the same economic shocks and face kind of the same solutions to their problems that will be applied equally and will have the same effect and distributionally be the same. But if, and this kind of has not been played out and it came to a head in 2008, and maybe the shift to technocracy is able to resolve some of these issues by having more experts and it being not, not so much in the hands of individual member states, but more so in the hands of technocratic and, and economic experts but then on the other hand another member state and political tension that the emu is facing is kind of relinquishing and giving up some state sovereignty that states aren't too excited to give up and that's why we see kind of hungary adopting a more eurosceptic approach mm. poland as well and romania to a certain extent with the rise of its far-right populist party so it's interesting to see kind of there's two different areas of tensions within the emu which is like in terms of expert expertise and an ability to deal with economic shocks, it has failed, as we saw in 2008. But then on the other hand, in terms of state sovereignty, this kind of further integration and, and deeper kind of kind of giving up of, of state sovereignty might be might be contentious. So it'd be interesting to see how it plays out um, in the coming years. Very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for being here with me today, Clara. And uh, I really enjoyed that. And now we're going to move on to part two of the Kumar Supervisor podcast. Hello, welcome to the second half of the Call My Supervisor podcast. So this is questions relating to the PhD experience specifically and the trials and tribulations that are involved in generally doing a PhD. 
And yeah, I'd like to know a lot about that with you, Constantin. So my first question would be, what attracted you in the first place to do a PhD? Yeah, thank you. I think there are very different motivations that got me into a PhD. And um, first of all, I had a general interest in science and researching, and I felt a personal desire to to kind of to dive a bit more deeper. And I think it's kind of a bit of a product of the MA at and political economy at King's because it's very research led, and we really read and learned about the very basics of what's going on in political economy, and um, that. Kind of, I wouldn't say started, I think it propelled a general interest in, in academic research and science. And then also um, when I was thinking about, okay, what do I want to do after my my MA at, at King's? And I was only 23 back then, and I felt a bit young and uh, not yet ready to, to work, to, to, do a, to do a proper job. So uh, for me, it was a very good combination of having this science research do it your own and and really dive deep into something combined with a lifestyle that is not the same, but in a sense similar to um, to the the one of the, of a student. So for sure, it's uh, life is a tad more serious at uh, at the PhD, but having the freedom of doing what you want at what time you want was uh, also a very uh, very, very sounded very nice to me, and um, I think this combination was very good for me, also in the form of a personal development perspective, to to have a bit of time to have kind of a, some character development, and um, yeah, I think those two together really got me into the PhD. Do you find the Dunning Kruger effect is real in that the more you learn, the more you feel like there is to learn? Yeah, sure, I definitely feel the most stupid since beginning my my undergrad studies. Uh, and I remember perfectly in my first semester undergrad, I felt like I've understood the world. Uh, introduction to microeconomics was really where I thought, okay, I've now I've hit the nail. And yeah, turns out uh, and now I feel like I know nothing. So um, it's, and, and when, when in discussions, some people ask me, hey, do you have an opinion on that? And I like, yeah, I may have a remote idea, but nothing beyond that. So uh, yeah, apparently, yes. So a lot of PhD candidates we've spoken to have said the process to them felt a lot more like a job than they were expecting. So the the, the process of research and, and, and writing up and interviewing. How has the process been for you? Has it, has it been as you expected or has it been very different? Generally, I would say it's more job-like than is a normal undergrad, postgrad study course. I got a very good advice from a friend who uh, was on the PhD already. And he said, plan your day in a certain way so you don't have the feeling I, I haven't done enough. So I've been very, very strong on myself and very hard to work for a certain amount of time. For example, I start the day 9 a.m. I'm sitting at my desk. I have a defined lunch break and I stop at six o'clock and I don't work on the weekends. And if I'm, I'm proud of myself that I mainly went with that schedule. So there were only very few occasions where I worked on the weekend because I had a submission deadline and um, that that helped for once and that felt a bit more job-like. On the other hand, um, for example, if there was an event or a friend's, uh, friend's birthday on on a Wednesday, I wasn't too hard on myself and then I okay, had an afternoon free on a Wednesday, which would not have been the case if I would have worked at a, at a proper job. So I think, and that's where I think it overlaps a bit between a normal job and a study course where you have more freedom than you would have in a normal job. But at the same time, if you don't see it as a proper job, I think you won't finish it. So um, a PhD is a lot of fun and it's interesting, but it's also a bit hard and you really have to work hard to, to get it done. So to what would you say you owe your success thus far? Is there any particular resource or person or activity in your personal life that you feel has pushed you on and given you that extra degree of motivation or satiated any desire to vary up your life a little bit 
I think, first of all, the most important part in a PhD are supervisors. And I'm lucky to have very, very good supervisors who not only on an academic level, uh, not only in academic regard, but also on a personal level, are tremendously important to my PhD journey. And um, having having a call during a period where it felt particularly hard or I was demotivated or didn't felt like a, or felt like a not making success or progress and jumping on the call with them, getting cheered up by them. I think it's very, very important because uh, your supervisors are kind of, if, if you have the feeling that your supervisors are happy with what you're doing, it's, it's a very good feeling and getting from this, yeah, this authority, so to say, uh, a thumbs up is always very helpful. And another thing that really helped a lot is I have a group of friends who are also doing PhDs, but in very, very different subjects. For example, law uh, in uh, media science and uh, in engineering and talking to them and specifically saying, okay, hey, how was your week? What have you done? And you hear from people who are doing very, very different things at first sight, telling you the very same struggles, struggles that you have experienced is so relieving and good. For example, a good friend of mine told me, yeah, today I've just deleted two pages because I realized it's absolute bullshit. So I kind of my progress was kind of negative, yet it was progress. And I said, yeah, that was my day as well. I just realized that my whole chapter was just bullshit. And um, getting to getting the feeling that you aren't alone in your PhD and that people have the same struggles was really helpful because a PhD can be very alone at times. And knowing that you aren't alone, that was something that really, really helped me in keeping it up. So what would you say has been your high point so far and your low point so far? I, I guess, has there been a particular time where you really questioned yourself on this? Yeah, I think the, the first year was really nice. I think it's just new to it. Pressure isn't super high. You start reading, you have lots of ideas. But then the second year, things became a bit more serious, I would say. And um, just after my upgrade, I felt a bit, okay, I've worked so much towards it, but now the, the next step, the next goal is so far away. And I think I felt a bit overwhelmed back then. And we had another lockdown at the same time. So it was really very bad timing on all fronts. And yeah, it wasn't, wasn't quite pleasant, to be honest. Um, and I think there were lots of highs as well. So I think all the time, I got a positive answer on interviews with people I would I wanted to speak to from which I knew they would be very helpful for me. And uh, as well as having successes on, on the quant part. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not a quant, quant kid, but getting it done, having results, and they are significant. That's really a very good feeling because then I knew, okay, I, I won't fail this PhD. Once I had this, this result, it was really, really a success. And I think it was about a year ago when I ran the first full of regression models with and seeing, okay, they're all significant at 99%. That was hands in the air and uh, really, really nice. But I think going through the PhD, it's important to have this minor, um, is small successes all the time and, and be aware of them because it's such a long time and you can't play it for just one goal or one success. Uh, loneliness um, and and solitary working has come up again and again in these podcasts as some of the biggest challenges or some of the most surprising things about a PhD. Is that consistent with your experience? I know you mentioned it um, just there earlier. And is it something that's that you've learned to overcome, or or can it be overcome? I think it's generally a thing all PhD students uh, struggle with or experience. I think it's also indiscriminate of the subject you are doing your PhD in, and surely I've experienced it. And um, it has two dimensions, I think. The first dimension is uh, being surrounded by people who do similar things, and that can be a PhD in a, another subject. And the other dimension is, and that's a bit difficult to overcome, is because you're doing a PhD and you're trying to do something unique, nobody else is there doing the same thing. You have people in the same field you can talk to at conferences etc but sometimes they go on a very different direction so it's not the very same thing 
And this loneliness is something I think you have to be okay with. And the loneliness you may have of kind of working alone is solvable by surrounding yourself with other people. And I would also advise that something I've done is doing something else too. Do some volunteering, uh, do some something that just gives you joy whenever your PhD isn't giving you a joy. So don't tie your whole self towards to the PhD, even though it means that you may need a bit longer for the PhD. Doing something that helps you kind of survive those those hard days and kind of having to do with people who are not doing academic work because sometimes it's just too much and having a connection to the real world, so to say, because PhD students, we are a very tiny group of people. And um, yeah, having contact to the normal world is quite helpful as well. So how would you say you unwind with regards to the more difficult times? Is there any particular volunteering activity that you like to engage in or a personal activity? How do you distress? I think they're very different things I would like to do. First of all, sport is very good because uh, I like outdoor sports. I cycle a lot and being outside perfectly in the sunshine, that's that's a perfect day then. But also I'm I'm I like people. Being surrounded by people, I, I have three siblings, so I'm I'm used to having a lot of people around me. And uh, I'm I'm funded through a scholarship of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation in Germany. And the foundation has uh as a program that's said, okay, here you have a lot of money or a certain amount of money that you can distribute like you wish for seminars and uh, scholarship holder activities. And uh, they have a kind of a self-developed structure on how to engage and make seminars. And I've done a lot there and volunteered there and uh, took over jobs in, uh, as a coordinator and as a speaker of the uh, scholarship holders. These activities were quite helpful because I was surrounded by people who sometimes also do a PhD, some were undergrad students, some were postgraduate students, and just having a good time with them was quite quite good and quite helpful because I got out of my town, I got somewhere else, had a very good weekend, spoke to very interesting people who are doing very different things, and that was very, very helpful also to just distress and kind of getting out of your usual environment, looking at the computer and trying to to get get your PhD ahead. Constantine, uh, three siblings. That sounds like a noisy house. How do you get anything done? Yeah, we we are a large family and we kind of uh, very very loud. My girlfriend is always a bit uh, overwhelmed when she meets my siblings because we we're kind of yeah uh, high energy kids. I am living alone in Berlin, so I'm on, on, on a daily basis. I do not have my siblings around, unfortunately, because, uh, yeah, I, I like them a lot and they, we, are, we are spread around the country. So meeting my family at home is usually where I can recharge, even though it's a very intense having, having three siblings. But, yeah, I think it was also formative in the sense of how I... Um, like to spend my free time, as I said, being surrounded by people. So I kind of, in a sense, I'm rebuilding this family atmosphere by by doing a lot with other people and uh, doing just yeah some random stuff just to just to have a good time. So that's also a question one can ask uh, themselves: is okay, what what made my family or at home so so nice for me, and how can I rebuild that? If your family is is a place where you felt that way to those people who are coming towards the end of their ma and are thinking about going after a phd what would your advice be what have you learned i think in general there are very different motivations for doing a phd if that's something you're generally interested and um no one is better or worse than the other i think it has to fit for yourself and a do see that my motivation might not work for other people. So I think you do have to combine some motivations and it has to make sense for you. And another thing is to have a break between your master and your PhD helps a lot because I think 
particularly the one year <laughs> master programs in the UK, they're quite intense. Also exhausting with having written your dissertation until late summer and starting a PhD in September or October is very cl close by. I think getting a bit off, having some free time, it also helps recharging your creativity. A PhD is, or science in general, is a creativity business. And uh, we have to get creative to do good at our jobs and um, recharging a bit, having a break, and then starting the PhD a bit fresher helps you in getting those this creativity. I think that's something I, I got as an advice and that helped me a lot. And I would definitely pass on this advice to everybody else. Yeah, and the, the other thing is to, to look out for yourself and surround yourself with people that can help you during the hard times and also during the good times. So you have to have people that you can celebrate your successes with, that you can talk to during hard times and um, ensure yourself against the difficulties that can emerge alongside the PhD. I think it's something you should consider and I think it can be built comparatively easily, but you have to be aware of that. One uh, question relative to you specifically, what's your favorite thing about Berlin? I was there a couple of years ago and I was based at Karl Marx Road. I can't remember the name of that particular district, but I really like that district. What's your favorite thing about Berlin in general? Do you have a particular district that, you know, piques your interest? The thing that I like most about Berlin is it's not a typical city in the sense that it has a kind of a center and a semi-periphery, but it's more like 20 small towns glued together. And in every part, it's kind of an own small city, and it's more more of a buffet. You can pick and choose whatever whatever you like and whatever you you you're looking for, and that's something that I really enjoy so much. Because, uh, for example, in summer, I really like to sit at the spree with the maybe with a beer, and uh, put my feet into the water, and you, you have this good life. And if you want to have a bit more action, you go to the area you stayed in and uh, have a have trendy bars uh you can go there and if you if, if you're tired of it you just go somewhere else and that's something um yeah i really enjoy i live in charlottenburg which is kind of the very other part of berlin uh but the housing market in berlin is not like you can really choose where you end up so uh it was was a bit of random but i'm very happy here and i have a lake very close by to my uh, apartment and sitting there in the summer reading stuff I need to do for the PhD is a very good, good, good part of life. And um, when I'm sitting there reading my a journal or so, I think, OK, it's PhD is not too hard. And that brings an end to today's episode. I would like to thank my co-host for today, Cameron, for his support. And I would like to thank Constantin for sharing his thoughts and his insights for this episode. Of course, thanks also to you, our listeners, for taking the time to tune in. And we look forward to welcoming you again soon for our next episode. Take care.